We are continuing our series in 1 Corinthians called Growing Pains. We are in verse 1 of chapter 2. So if you'll take your Bibles and go to page 1213 in a Schofield Bible. We're continuing to talk about um, what Paul was trying to get the Corinthian believers to recognize. And I think it's important for us as believers to see that there are many things that we can also put into our lives as practice. I love this kind of study, verse by verse. This is how I do my devotions. Uh, Particularly when I go through the Proverbs, I like to just take my time and go through them. And sometimes I'm able to get them in the morning. Sometimes I'll get them throughout the remainder of the day. But the whole point is to let the Word of God saturate my mind and affect how I make decisions. Uh, I had an email come across my desk and someone had asked me, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It's a great question. How do you know you're walking in the Spirit? Well, I believe the way that we walk in the Spirit is we, first of all, we don't sin. And I know that's impossible. But we try our best to not do sinful activities. And the only way we can do something that's right and pleases the Lord is understand what God's Word says about Himself. So I think a great step of obedience in walking with the Lord is to study your Bible. And that's what we like to do here at Calvary. And if you look in your Bibles, you'll see what God wants you to do. The Old Testament is full of records and illustrations that we can learn from. And the New Testament is a lot of life application and practical use that we can glean and then put into practice in our own lives. But walking in the Spirit is making good decisions that are informed by the study of God's Word. And so I think doing a a book study through 1 Corinthians, or really like we did in Proverbs, is beneficial for every believer. Um, If you have something to write with, I want you to take it and maybe take a piece of paper, and I want you to make a list. I want you to write the numbers 1 through 5. We're going to get to this towards the end of my message. But right now, I I saw this on Wednesday evening when I went to go see... uh, Pastor Dave Peterson out there at First Baptist Church of Land Lakes um, to see how they do their prayer meetings. And he did this as a part of his message, and I thought this was a good practice. And I want you to write down in these five spots that you have what you want your life to produce. So the first, the first thing would be the most important thing you want your life to produce. And then the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. It can be one word, it can be a phrase, it can be a whole sentence. But I want you to think about the five things that you want your life to produce. I think it's a good study for a believer to have goals, to have something that you are looking forward to accomplishing. We're coming up on the beginning of uh, 2021, and you know what's going to be talked about is all of the Uh, New Year's resolutions and the things that we did poorly in 2020 and trying to improve upon those things in 2021. But we can do that right now just by trying to figure out what do you want your life to produce? Not necessarily where you want to work or necessarily how you want God to use you. Just what do you want your life to produce? When it's all said and done, what do you hope to produce out of the things you've done with the time that God has given you? So as you're finishing up there, let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. We're going to try and cover verses 1 through 8 this evening. But the topic is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There are three different sections here. Paul talks about not my, ex- not my excellency, only Jesus in verses 1 through 2. He says, hear me and see Him in verses 3 through 5. And in, ver- and in verses 6 through 8, it talks about the destruction of man's wisdom. So I want you to look in verses 1 through 2 with me here. Paul, he is continuing to build upon this theme of putting God's wisdom above man's wisdom. Remember, they were splitting into these different categories. They were taking sides. And they were saying, well, this person is higher than this person's teaching. And they were no longer focusing on what the Word of God said or what the Word of God deemed to be valuable and profitable and wise, but what other men were saying. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, And I, brethren, when I came to you, and you should circle these next two words, came not. 
And there was what he, there's a description of what he did not come to them with, which was with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Now we know this cannot be referring to God's wisdom because he told us in verses 18 through 25 of chapter 1 that God's wisdom is what makes man's wisdom foolish. This must be with man's wisdom. So he's not saying, he's saying here, I did not come to you with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Now, it's not a poor habit, it's not a bad thing to have good vocabulary when you speak. But if the motive behind your message is to impress or to bring glory to how much you have prepared or the things that you say, um, then you need to check yourself because Paul is saying here, I didn't come to you in that mentality. Here's what he did come with. Declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now I want you to hold your place here and go to Philippians chapter 3. This is on page 1259 in a Schofield Bible. Philippians chapter 3. Hold your place there in 1 Corinthians. And go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. Here's a small character sketch of the writer of First and Second Corinthians and a majority of the New Testament. Paul is describing himself here in Philippians 3, verses 4 through 6. Here's what it says. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. All of these are characteristics of what the world would call a godly person. And Paul spent his entire life studying God's Word. He became a Pharisee, so he had memorized significant portions of Scripture. He understood the ways of the Pharisees. He knew all the ceremonies. He knew all the rituals. He knew the thought behind them, or so he thought. And what he's saying here in verse 4 is, he has the confidence, he could have the confidence of the flesh if that was, was required of a person to know God and have God's wisdom. But look what he says in verse 7. But what things were gained to me? And I want to stop there. Everything that he said in verses 4 through 6 were things that were gained to him. These are credentials that the world would have looked at, the people of Israel certainly looked at, and said, oh yes, this person qualified to go into the kingdom. This person knows more about the Word of God than I know. This person is better than me because of the things that they do. So now continue and see how he describes all of those definitions of himself, all of his manly qualifications. Those I counted, what? Loss for Christ. So he lost something to gain something. The effectiveness of his knowledge and teaching, it all faded away when he learned the truth of a particular person. Jesus Christ. Look in verse 8. Yea, doubtless. He's, he's confirming. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung as waste that I may win Christ. Now, we're going we're gonna to read verse 9, but I just want you to hold... You, you had already held your place in 1 Corinthians. Just glance over to 1 Corinthians in chapter 2 and verse 1 and notice the word that is used there. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech and wisdom. Now go back to Philippians and see what he says in verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of what? The knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. You have two things that could be called excellent. Wise words, crafty speeches, impressive language. 
and Jesus Christ. A good preacher, a good teacher, a good disciple focuses on the excellency of Christ Jesus, not on the excellency of themselves. And this is why the gospel message, the teaching of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, should be of the utmost importance and the highest value in every ministry and every individual in that ministry. When the focus goes outside of that, then you begin to question what the real motive and intent is. One of the things I was, I was blessed to do while I was at Pastor Dave Peterson's church this last Wednesday night was just talk to him and hear him offer words of encouragement to me to stay on the path of sharing the gospel. Preachers, we're in a very difficult time right now because our nation has expectations for what churches should do and we still believe we have individual freedom to make choices and people will want to judge you on those choices. I am so thankful for our governor who has made it a point that he will allow religious freedom to continue. But there are many states where that is not so. And while we still have the opportunity to preach God's Word and teach God's Word, we're going to do that. And it's very important to recognize what we do with that opportunity. I don't want this pulpit to become a pulpit for only Republican views or conservative views. I want this pulpit to be about the excellency of Christ Jesus, period. And there are many things that fall into that category. But you in your life need to make sure that Christ is at the, at the center of it. Continue with me in Philippians 3.9. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Look in verse 6. Touching the righteousness which is in the law. Paul was as close to the law as you could get. He handled it. He knew it. He was around it. Yet what he says in verse 9 is he is to be found in Christ. Not having mine own righteousness, which is all that he described in verses 4-6. through six, and what he described as dung in verse 8. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. How can a person know that they're going to heaven? Read that verse. But that which is through the faith of Christ, by putting your trust in Jesus Christ and in Him alone, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Not by your good works, not by your good deeds. We are so blessed to be able to understand the gospel message. And we should take that understanding of the gospel message and continue to tell people what we have learned. This is how churches start. This is how ranches catch on fire for the Lord. It is some of the most encouraging news in the world when I have gone through a long week and I get to Thursday and I'm tired and I just am irritated with different things that are going on and a kid comes up to me and tells me I led a friend to Christ this week. That is a huge encouragement to me because that young kid understood what God had done for him, learned it, and then took time to share it with a friend. That's how the church grew in the book of Acts. And although we may not have high numbers in ranch, and there are many reasons why that's not the case, I still believe our ministry is extremely profitable in the eyes of God because of the amount of kids that are trusting Christ. I believe there's many youth groups around the area where kids could go for several months and not understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. And I want to make sure that this ministry focuses on reaching people for that cause. Not the excellency of the program, not the excellency of the things that are said in the program, but the excellency of Christ Jesus, period. Now look in verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. What is in the power of the resurrection? 
The regeneration of that soul that was separated from God. When a person believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they are then regenerated. Now, the Calvinist position doesn't teach that. In fact, it says regeneration happens first. See, God has to give you the faith to believe. I don't believe that's true. Because if you look in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, the exact steps of regeneration are presented. After that, ye heard the word of truth, and ye believed, ye were sealed. It didn't happen first. The sealing didn't happen first, and then you believe. You put your trust in Jesus Christ, and as a part of that, a promise that is to every believer is that you will receive the Holy Spirit, which is an earnest of the inheritance of the purchased possession. That's you. All who have trusted in Christ, their destination was set, heaven. Not that they would believe or not. That is an individual decision for each person. But God said, I've predestined where that person will go if they believe. Isn't that a great God that gives you the opportunity, gives you the free will to say yes or no? That's the power of the resurrection. Look in the rest of this verse. And the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Look in verses 13 through 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I, and you should mark this, I press forward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Every area of our life should be a pressing forward for the mark of Christ Jesus. Now, I believe that it's every single person's responsibility that has trusted in Christ to share that message. I don't think that that's a gift that's only to a certain part of the church. But I do believe that we all have different gifts and talents and abilities to help get that message out. Something as important as building something for a ministry can help lead a person to Christ. I'll give you an example with these screens that just went up. I'm the last person you would want to do this job. If I was hired to do that job, there would still be holes in the roof. Still. Because I don't have that talent and ability. But there was a, a person who wanted to do that, had the talent and ability to do it, built them the right way, they continue to work. I believe that if the gospel is put on those screens and there is an opportunity for someone to put their trust in Christ, that person's labor was pressing towards the mark. So the talents and abilities that you have, you can either use them for the things of the world or you can use them for the things of God. Well, what are the things of God? What pertains to Christ? What helps get Him known by people? Surely people in this country know who Jesus Christ is, but do they know what He did for them? Do they know the freedom that is found within His death, burial, and resurrection? Many people don't. I listened to a YouTube video today. It was 8 minutes and 30 seconds. And it was so heretical. But it was a false teaching on the ten virgins parable. The five that were ready were those believers that endured to the end because of their good works. And the five that weren't ready, well, those were the ones who were messing around and living sinfully, and oh, the door is shut to them. And Jesus says, depart from, you, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. And the teaching was, that's the disobedient believer. They are in the threat of hellfire if they don't get right. I think that's a heresy. Do you want to know why? Because Jesus says in John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now how, and this will sound strong, but it's a good question to ask, how can we say that Jesus is good and right if He forgets those who once knew Him? Who He once knew. How can we say that He's good and true if He can forget you? How could He look at me and say, Jesse, I never knew you? That would not be true. That's the teaching that's out there. And so I scroll to the comment section, and it is 
So sad to see what's in the comments section. I see comments like, how do I know I'm really saved then? And we have the assurance of what God's Word teaches, but there is somebody commenting somewhere who doesn't. And so I left a lengthy comment, and I put my email at the end. And I said, you can email me if you have a question about this. But once a person is saved, they're saved forever. You can be disobedient. You have the free will to do that, but you will receive discipline, a loss of rewards, but you'll never be taken outside of the family. That's not biblical. The Bible doesn't teach that. In verse 14, I want you to see here, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. To proclaim Christ for this Corinthian church was their high calling. It was what they were supposed to do. And they were quibbling with each other about what group they were in and what man's wisdom said about certain things and letting the wisdom of God fall to the wayside. You can let Philippians go. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're not going to stay here for long. But I want you to look at another passage here, or another phrase that is used here. First of all, after reading everything we saw in Philippians 3, now read verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 2. For I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. At the end of verse 1, we have an interesting phrase here. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. Highlight that testimony of God. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. Hold this passage here and go to 1 John in chapter 5. Look in verse 9. This is on page 1325. 1 John 5 in verses 9 through 13. That word testimony in both cases here, you'll see testimony or testified in verse 9. But here's the definition of it according to the Strong's Dictionary. Give evidence, bear record, or have a good report of. And in both cases, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 1 and 1 John 5, 9, the same word is used. If, so look in uh, 1 John 5, 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God. Now stop. I'm a simple boy. I'm not very smart in the eyes of the world. I love this passage because it's so clear. What's the, wis- what's the witness of God? I wonder. Look what it says. You're about to find out. Are you excited to see the clarity of God's word here? Which he has, and if we put that definition, given evidence, bared record, or had a good report that's what testified there is, of his son. He that what? He that believeth on the Son of God, Jesus Christ, hath the witness in himself. And he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not what? The record. What's the record? It's Jesus Christ. Verse 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. The Corinthian church was missing this point in all that they were trying to do. They were taking sides. There were 14 other things that they were doing, and we'll discover that throughout this series. But this is the principal thing that every believer should be focusing on. Now, I say to those who are not saved, You can know that you have a certain kind of life, eternal life, by the record of God's Son, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. You can know that. And there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, I would even say millions of people that miss this point. They turn the qualifications onto themselves They analyze their good works and good deeds, and that feels good to us. You know why? Because it appeals to our pride. You go and visit a psychiatrist or someone in psychology, they want you to always try and better yourself if they don't try to put you on medication first. But they try to get you to do better about yourself and blame somebody else for problems that are because of your actions, and before you know it, 
you build yourself up as the solution to all your problems. That may help your life here temporarily, but we will all have to give an account. The believers will have to give an account to Jesus in the judgment seat of Christ. Unbelievers will have to give a terrifying account to God at the great white throne judgment. And everyone who attends that judgment and is in it is toast. It's it's already over for them. So we want to know how we can have eternal life. What must I do to be saved? Verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and that this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son. How does a person hath the Son? They believe on Him. Hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That is the testimony of God. So you can let that passage go and look what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. What must that have been? Jesus Christ only. We know what Paul said to these Corinthian believers. or At that point, they were lost as he began to win them to, to Christ. He spoke of Jesus Christ. Paul said he didn't want to know anything among them save Jesus Christ. So our ministry, our lives, I believe, should reflect the same things. I know it is difficult to soul win and reach people, but maybe that's because you've only seen one kind of soul winning. There are so many ways you can lead a soul to Christ. Your Facebook account should be a place where a person within two or three posts can see and have the gospel presented to them. There are bio tag lines that you can use to do that. You can make videos. Did you know that each and every one of you can go live? That's how entrenched Facebook is in your life. By a simple, maybe a mistake of a click of a button, you're broadcasting to the world. I have some friends on Facebook that I've never met, but they are people from different pages that have found me and they understand that I'm clear gospel. And just the other day, a gentleman was going live from a totally different country, and he was using that opportunity. There were two viewers, me and somebody else, and I don't know who the other person was. But he read the gospel and clearly defined salvation. That's a way to soul win. You can soul win by calling people and texting people and writing emails. I I get emails from a gentleman I never even gave him my email address. And I still get emails from him. But he's clear on the gospel. And he shares it just about once every week. That's a ministry for him. Jim Blevins. You guys know Jim Blevins. He uses his social media as an opportunity to reach people for Christ. In fact, he'll just tag Yankees videos in, in different YouTube comments, spamming it away. I... Great! That's a good thing. There are many ways to soul win. Is your desire to reach people? And that may be a hard question because I know we live in a world right now where we are very divided. And it can become, it can become very easy to look at a person simply by what they say, one thing that they say, or maybe even nowadays a t-shirt that they wear and automatically put them in a category that is distasteful to us. And therefore, we don't want to talk to someone who thinks that way or does that thing. Friend, in the eyes of Jesus, everybody fell short, and he still spent time with people. The Pharisees accused him of eating with the sinners and the publicans, and ugh. But Jesus knew that he could reach people. He knew what he was supposed to do. One of the greatest things I love about the story about the woman in the well is in John 4 and chapter 1, it says, they must needs go through Samaria. Do you realize what that was back then? I want to talk about racial tension. Big tension in Samaria. But they had to go through it. Why? There was a woman at a well. 
And one of the coolest things about that story is when she understood who Jesus was, she ran back to the city. I wonder, did she run by the disciples? Did she run by them? Did they notice her? What did she do when she got to the city? She reached people. She shared what was just shared with her. How many tens of people trusted Christ that day? And the apostles come back and they're like, are you hungry? And Jesus says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And they said, where? Where is it? I'm not making fun of them. But the wisdom of man just doesn't get it. The fields are white, all ready to harvest. This is our opportunity. We don't know how much time we have left. We really don't. We really do not know. Jesus Christ is the record of God given to all mankind that He has given eternal life to anyone who believes on His Son. Now look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going, to rem- we're going to stay here now in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and talk through these next several verses. Look in verses 3 through 5. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In, in Greek philosophy, those Greek philosophers, they are... People depend on their knowledge to build their lives. And what Paul is saying here is, when I spoke to you, I came to you, I was weak, I had fear, I was in much trembling. Obviously, he was nervous. I still like that I get nervous. You know why? It shows me that I'm not thinking I've arrived. Hardly ever do I walk into this pulpit with all the confidence in myself. And if you see any confidence, I'm telling you right now, it's from God's Word. I'm so serious about that. His Word is so clear. I'm glad that I get to teach from this and not from some Buddhist commentary. There is truth and life within these Scriptures. But Paul said the weakness that he had, the fear that he had, the the, the trembling that he had, was because he knew of his shortcomings and he therefore taught Christ. Look what it says in verse 4. And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words. We've covered that, but underscore where those words would have come from. Man's wisdom. But in, excuse me, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now, Paul obviously was able to do apostolic miracles, but besides that, He was able to take the Word of God and show them where Christ had been through all of that. That's the demonstration. He could see, he could show them where Christ was in the Scriptures. I believe that's where a lot of people were impressed because the Word of God proved itself. Think about the two that were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus spent time with them and showed them how he was all through the Scripture. Can you imagine? Dude, sign me up for that Bible study. I just want to see the Facebook Live of that. Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now I want to stop here for a second and uh, go back to verse 6 there. Howbeit we speak wisdom unto them that are perfect, not perfect in spiritual, uh, like completion, or uh, uh, manly completion that they do no sin, but they are mature. And when they speak here in wisdom among them that are mature, it's still not the wisdom of this world. It's more teaching from God's Word. It's more revelation from God's Word. Look very quickly over there in verse 18 of chapter 1. If you have a Schofield Bible, it's just right across the page. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. 
Look what it says in verse 26, or excuse me, uh, verse 27 of chapter 1. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen, one, uh, hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things, and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Now look very quickly at the end of verse 6. Nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. The wisdom of God is continually bringing man's wisdom to nothing. That's what that phrase means. It means nothing. Absolutely nothing. When an unbeliever will have to stand before God and they give an account, any manly or worldly wisdom that they have, it will mean nothing there. Yet people spend their entire lives seeking the wisdom of this world. And they can't find it. Verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And I believe that wisdom is Jesus Christ, as we saw in 1 John 5, 9 through 13, as we saw in Philippians 3, verses 8 through 14. It was Jesus Christ who was set up before the foundation of the world to be in that role, to be in that position as the sacrificial lamb. Before the world even came into existence and all of its ages began and all of the quote-unquote wisdom of the world ever even started, there was the wisdom of God. And it was good and it was perfect and it was complete. That's what Paul speaks. That's what he talks about. And that's what the Corinthian church needed to focus on. They were getting away from that. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. And he gives a proof for that. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wow. You think they knew? They didn't. I just got done teaching Life of Christ. And it is amazing to study the trial of Jesus Christ. The Scripture says they, they, they tried to find a witness, but there was none that was satisfactory for it. And so they just lobbied some claim against him. Uh, yeah, he said he'd destroy the temple. And the high priest says, did you do this? Because they knew. I think they were annoyed. Like, that's not what we want to persecute him for or prosecute him for. Did you do this? Jesus doesn't say anything. And then they get fed up and they, they ask him, do you claim to be the Son of God? And he says, thou hast said it. And you knew that was an affirmative answer because those high priests tore their clothes. They beat him. Then they brought him before Pilate. And Pilate was like, disguise of Nazareth. Sent him to Herod. And Herod mocked him. Sent him back to Pilate. And the scripture takes note that there was a friendship that was developed because of that. And they rush that trial, and Pilate even says, I find no fault. His wife was like, please get this man out of here. I've had dreams of him. And he washes his hands and gives it to the Jews to make the decision. If they would have known, they wouldn't have crucified him. The wisdom of man, subpar, not even worthy to be compared, brought to not to nothing in the eyes of the wisdom of God. So what can we learn from this? Paul is setting something up here. He's setting something up in chapter 3 because he's about to... This is kind of like the rearing back of the discipline. And in chapter 3, that discipline is going to start coming down. And it's going to sting because the Corinthian church knows but just real briefly, look in chapter 3. It's just a page turn away. And I, brethren, uh-oh, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So we'll just leave that there. We'll get there. Not next week, but it'll probably, because I, I won't be here next week. I'm going to be on vacation. But the week after that, we won't get to it. It'll probably be the week after that. So the 27th, we'll get to that part. But he's setting them up here. Not so he can just like make fun of them, but to recenter them 
on what, look, this is what matters. Here's what you're doing. Is it possible that we as believers can deceive ourselves into thinking we're godly and we're just sinning continually? Yes. That can happen. How do we avoid that? What we did today with communion, I think, is, is a very important practice in a believer's life. Not just a ritual, but it is an important practice to remember the things that we have done against the Lord, confess them, and restore that fellowship. Consequences will come. And some consequ- you know, many consequences you cannot avoid. But getting right with the Lord and then making good decisions and continuing that good habit is how you can be used better and better and better and more efficiently by God. So what can we learn from this? I beg and plead you to know the Word of God. And any kind of advice or wisdom that you hear outside of God's Word, test it. Just test it. I'm so glad this ministry is able to sniff out Calvinism. Because there are many, many ministries who were like you and me, but they couldn't discern that. And now they're, they're Calvinistic. The church I grew up in. Calvinistic doctrine sta- uh, doctrinal statement. And they say in the same breath, you're saved by faith, but you've got to be regenerated first. Huh? What? Why? They miss it. Even if I ever you know, do get a doctorate, I don't want people to know. Because sometimes I feel like people will be like, oh, yeah, well, he's a doctor. I, look, you know, you can know the same thing that I know. I'm not criticizing people that have doctor degrees. We have two great doctors in here, Dr. Polson, Dr. Arnold. But these men don't rely on themselves. They rely on the Scripture. But there are many people who look at titles and things and they say, oh, well, look, he wrote a big book. He must be right. Here's the big book that we know is right. (laughs) So study this. I'm going to share the gospel message with you. And I'm going to continue to share it as long as I live because this is all we have. As Paul said, I am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This hand represents you and me. My wallet represents sin. We all have sin. The penalty of sin is death, eternal separation from God forever in a place called hell. Just to illustrate John 3.16, this hand represents Jesus Christ, God's Son. This was the record. We studied it tonight. This is the, the, the witness of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the message that Paul taught thousands of years ago in Corinth. And it hasn't changed. It has not changed. But man has distorted it. One of the greatest truths out of this little exchange here is it's a one-time exchange. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're eternally secured forever once you put your trust in Christ. There is nothing you could do or not do that would take you and have this back as a responsibility for you. People teach this. They say, oh, you think you're this, but hey, you're still doing wrong. You're really this. And if you boil it down and you read their their positional papers, God made people like this and He made people like this. And you don't get to choose. What kind of God is that? It's not the God of the Bible. God made people. People sinned. God died to pay for what we could never pay and gave us the choice. Here's the record of my son. He that believeth, beareth the record. He that believeth not, maketh God to be a liar. It's that simple. Do you believe in what Jesus did? Or do you reject? It's a one-time thing. And I want to encourage you, if you have not believed on what Christ has done for you, you are in threat of eternal separation from God forever in a place called hell. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. 
And if you already know that message, you should be gearing up to continue to, to teach it and share it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you've never understood the gospel, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're here in the, in the sanctuary, in the auditorium, you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. I, I, I beg you, please, to put your trust in Christ today. To put your trust in, in Jesus is to rely on Him that He paid for your sins. He was buried and rose again three days later. And you can know that you have eternal life by believing on Him. The same thing for those of you on the internet. And I, I, can, I, I pray that this study has blessed you and that you are encouraged to see that a ministry that is focused on Jesus Christ is a profitable ministry. And we're blessed. We are so blessed to understand what Jesus has done for us. And we can pass that along to others, especially during a holiday season of a very difficult year. Will you join me in prayer? Father, thank You so much for all that You have done for us in Your Word. I pray, Lord, that You would encourage us through the Spirit to speak up, share our faith, remind us to study Your Word, and Lord, I ask that we would all make decisions to be found faithful in the study of Your Word, in prayer, in good church attendance with like-minded believers, and in sharing the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bible Line, make sure to subscribe to the channel and share this video with a friend. Do you have a Bible question? Send us an email, questions at BibleLineMinistries.org, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. Or you can leave your question in the comments of this video. Be sure to check the links in the description for more clear Bible teaching. Bible Line is a ministry of Calvary Community Church located in Tampa, Florida.